in getting prepped for this whole series, now I was looking at different organizations and how they described uh, burnout. This is the one from the World Health Organization. Burnout is a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. To which I thought, that is so, so helpful, right? Just reading that makes me feel burnt out, right? It's just like, it, it's, not, it's not a great, it's just like, ugh, right? In fact, the book that we, I talked about last week, uh, the author Ann uh, Peterson, the book Can't Even How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation, here's how she summarizes it. For those of you who are millennials, anxiety, stress, and depression have become our generation's unwanted companions. And again, you ought to go listen to what she has to say about that. She's done some interviews, some, uh, some stuff on YouTube you can find. She's written some articles, the book that she's written. Um, so here's the question based just thinking about how we typically, what we typically associate burnout with. What if, what if the problem isn't our job? Yeah, I heard somebody go, ah, because they're like, oh, I, was, I was hoping to my job, right? You know, because we kind of think that's, that's the problem. If, if I, my job was just better or wasn't so stressful or didn't overschedule or didn't ask for so much, it would be so much. But what if the problem isn't our job? And this is where it's going to get a little touchy for just a moment, so I'm warning you. I'm not trying to be mean today. I'm not trying to come on hard. I'm not going to yell and scream at you. I'm not going to command you to do it. I'm not going to tell you you have to do it. I'm just saying, I want us to think for a second. What if the problem isn't all that stuff? What if it's something closer to us? I mean, think about it. The, how, we, uh, how we handle things. You know, when stuff comes, how do we handle it, right? How do we, how do we respond to it? How, how do we process things? How do we see things, right? Because all of us see things in a little bit different way how we respond to things, because all of us respond to things a lot different ways, right? Some of us just keep it in, keep it in until boom. Others of us just get it out of the way early, right? Boom, 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 boom. How we react to things, how we carry things. In fact, I ran across this idea that there are three internal causes of burnout. First one is we focus on our feelings rather than the facts. You know, we, we believe this idea that if we feel it, it must be true. Because I feel it has to be. I mean, I'm feeling it. This is, this is happening to me, so it, there's got to be some truth to it, right? And there's something that we all know intuitively, but don't always like to believe. And it's simply that our feelings aren't always accurate or true. And you know this yourself, because there's a time in your life when you have liked somebody, and they did not like you, right? And you had really strong feelings for them, right? Right? You know, maybe you do those little pictures, you know, when you're in a school, little hearts, and you put your name and put the initials and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, oh, you were like, oh, so much. I just love, you know, had their poster up on your wall. And it's like, you know, you were just like, ah, oh, right? And then it's like, you know, the, the feelings aren't always accurate or true. But it is one of our internal causes of burnout is that we, we begin to get our feelings and we read so much into our feelings, we turn it into a reality. Another internal cause of burnout is we compare ourselves to others, right? We look at others and we think, man, if I could get to that position, life would be so much easier, right? So much better. I wouldn't have all this stuff to deal with. And we forget that everybody has some kind of stuff to deal with. But it's easy to make that thing because we're surrounded by this stuff, this constant blast of how good other people's lives are, right? I mean, we're all, if you're on social media and you have some friends, you know you have at least one friend, at least one friend, who loves to tell you how wonderful their life is, how fantastic it is. They're always sending pictures, posting stuff, right? But how great life is. And, and if you know that person really well, you may be like the, the person I'm thinking of that I know really well. It's like, I know that's not their life. They're just putting it out there to make, make it seem like, you know, to kind of get that play and kind of feel good, but it's, it's not that happening. And we also forget that, that everyone's different, right? In fact, if you grew up with a sibling, right, a brother or sister, you knew that you were different, right? Even though you grew up in the exact same family, right, doesn't mean you're going to end up in the exact same spots when you get done. Everybody's life is unique. You know, if, if you're married, you, you and your spouse's wives are unique. Your kids' lives are unique from yours. They're part of that life, but they're unique from your life. And only we can be us, which I'm not sure is great English, but it's a true statement, right? And you've heard it before, you know, nobody else can be you, be the best you you can be. And, and there's some, actually some truth to that. 
Because when we begin to compare, we always lose. Because there's always somebody who's got something and doing something better that we think if we just got there, things would be so much better. And the third internal cause of burnout is we exaggerate the negative. You know, something goes wrong and it's like, oh, this is a disaster. This isn't just, you know, I, I was late turning this in or I made this little mistake in the report. I need to go back and correct it. It's like, oh, now it's going to go on my annual review and now I'm going to hear about it. And now, now I won't get the promotion. We just go blah, 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 all, all that. Some of us are really talented at this, by the way. Some of us, that's sort of our gift, right? We can make anything negative, right? Just turn it that way. And the problem is it's, it's not just our bodies that are at risk, but it's our minds, our souls. You know, it's not just the, you know, the internal stuff that happens physically, but it begins the, the stuff that begins to hit our brains and begins to affect us. And there's a reason for those three internal causes of burnout. It's simply this, that we live in a world where burnout is normal. And the question for us ought to simply be, how, how, how did we get here, right? I mean, how is this normal? How could this have turned into this kind of thing? And to that, I would ask us another what if question. What if, what if we've been fed a lie? And if a lie is too strong for you, a myth. Let us, we'll go that way, right? Because here's, here's a lie that I'm guessing you have heard. It's, we talked about it last week. Ann Peterson in her, in her article talked about this idea of an ideology that you millennials have been sold on that you weren't even aware that you were being sold on it, right? It just became the, the piece there. But here's one of them for all of us. It's, it's rest happens when the work is done, right? You know, get your chores done first. I mean, it's been around since your great, great, great grandparents were out on a farm someplace, right? Get your chores done, then you can do that, right? Get your homework done, then you can, right? You can play, you can do whatever you want, but you got to get your stuff done first. And here's the question we all need to ask ourselves. Because the reality, if you have one of those great jobs that you can actually finish something and be done with it and never have to touch it again, I don't, I'm not fortunate to have that kind of job. Stuff is never finished, right? Because my big business is people, and people are never done, right? Until, you know, it's like way down the line, and then that's, you know, that's a whole other piece to it, right? But let's be, I mean, but, but you know, working it. And, and the crazy thing, if you got that thing, even if you got the kind of job that you get stuff done, put it in the box, you're, you're done, you're, you walk away. When you get home, I'm guessing you got work to do, right? All those dishes, you've been waiting for the right moment to get out of the sink, right? The, you know, all that trash that, you know, been kind of building up, but now like, you know, tomorrow's trash day, so you need to get it out. The, the work is never done, right? And since we all know that to be true, here's the follow-up question. Since the work doesn't stop, maybe we have to. Maybe it's up to us to step in and take some control, to do something to change things up. Uh, if you've been around New Hope for a while, you know that I have a couple of favorite authors that I come back to regularly. I had both of them in, my, in today's message, but I cut one of them out at the last minute. Um, it's, it's a really good quote she has, but we're going to put her off. Brene Brown, uh, this, this brilliant uh, brain researcher, uh, become a real popular uh, person on a lot of uh, talk events. Uh, I, I love what she writes about this. She says, listen, crazy busy, crazy busy, right, is great armor. It's a great way for numbing. Right? We stay busy. You know, I just kind of just, I, I'm busy. That's what I do. I stay busy because then I just stay busy, right? She goes on to write, what a lot of us do is that we stay so busy and so out front of la our life that the truth of how we're feeling and what we really need can't catch up with us. So maybe the problem really is us, right? You got somebody a whole lot smarter than me telling you that, so pay attention to her, right? Now me, as a, as a religious person, I would add another element to it. And that is that when we live there too long, it starts to damage our soul. When we keep staying busy, which isn't good for us physically or mentally, you know, just over, over, over stretch, and we don't deal with the stuff. We just do that so we don't have to deal with the stuff. Something happens inside of us. And what if, what if God created us for more? Not more work, but for more than tired. In fact, it was one of the, the great 
invitations that Jesus made. Uh, the scene is, uh, he's, you know, he's with a big crowd of people like he was so often was. Um, got, he's been talking about lots of different stuff, which he often does with big crowds, right? He kind of goes, he's just talked about, you know, how bad it's going to be with a, some, some group of people because of how they have or haven't responded to what he said. Uh, then he's going to say, listen, I'm so thankful to my father that he's revealed some things to you all, the crowd he's talking to, that he hasn't revealed to those really smart people standing over in that crowd over there, the religious leaders, right? That God's revealed something to you. Um, And then he makes this invitation to this crowd who stand there. And again, if you've been around a place like this for very long, you've probably heard this at some point uh, over Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Jesus says to the crowd, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are tired. Anybody tired? It's us, right? This is one of those, this isn't just a, you know, when I told you before, when we look at this, is this prescriptive or descriptive? That's one of those great open things. This is for everybody kind of thing. So if you're tired, if you're weary, I love the word weary better because just when you say the word weary, it makes you weary, right? It's just like one of those words. Come to me, all of you who are tired, who are weary and heavy and have heavy loads, overburdened. Anybody else out there, right? He's kind of covering all the bases, right? And he's saying to this group of people, listen, if you're just kind of weighed down with all this stuff, if you're over all this stuff, come to me because I will give you rest. One of the greatest promises from Jesus, because he's promising us if we'll do something, that if we'll come to him, if we will step that way, that he will provide this for us. In fact, in this particular, in the expanded version, it goes on and says, accept my teachings, Literally, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, right? Um, this idea of when we begin to fall in line with his teachings, we begin to learn some things about what it looks like to follow Jesus. And he says, listen to do this because I'm gentle and humble in spirit. I'm not here to get down on all you folks. I'm here to try to relieve you folks because of this. And again, you will find rest for your lives, for your souls, this is more than just, you know, rest. You get to go home and take a nap this afternoon. This is like something deep inside of us. But he didn't finish here. He went on and said, listen, the burden that I ask you to accept, I'm going to ask you to carry something. But the thing I'm going to ask you to accept, my, my yoke is the little language there. I want you to know it's easy. And the load I give you to carry, my burden is light. And for those of us that, are, that feel just worn out and we're kind of like, I'm just so over all these things, uh, let me just say this to you. If, if you're carrying too much, it's probably not what Jesus asked us to carry. And if the reason is, is because of this. Boys and girls, if you don't know what that is, that's called a yoke. I want you to notice something very important about the yoke. There are how many sides to it? Very good. Two sides. Really smart group today. Two sides to it, which means you're not carrying it by yourself. He says, here's my yoke. Strap on with me, and we're going to make it through this together. I'm going to help carry I'm going to relieve that. The part I'm going to ask you to is, is going to be less than. In fact, they, they would use this oftentimes in, in Jesus' day, and even after and probably even before, you know, they would take this old seasoned veteran of an ox, you know, your, your big strong ox, and you put the, the new little upstart, you put him with the old one, and you let the old one kind of guide him around and get used to carrying the load and giving him a little bit more load, more load. It was this idea, I'm going to teach you how to not be over all the stuff that you're going to feel over with. Jesus invites us to join up with him, to come to him, to accept his teaching, to, to follow along with him and to, and to take on his yoke. It's not as heavy as it looks. We're not going to have to carry the whole load ourselves. Because what if, what if God doesn't want something from us, but for us? In fact, let's go back to um, another time when, when God talked about rest in a little bit different way. Exodus chapter 20 is the uh, list of what we call the Ten Commandments, right? And anytime you read the list of Ten Commandments, you have to start with what's called the preamble, the, the, the basis for all the stuff that follows. It's found in verse 2 of Exodus chapter 20. 
And here's what Moses told the people speaking for God. I am the Lord. Who's God? Your God. Oh, by the way, the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, where you were slaves from literally from the house of bondage. I am the Lord, your God, and I brought you out from the house of bondage. And if you're over, over anything, over stress, over schedule, you feel like you're in a house of bondage, right? And God's saying, listen, I'm the one that brought, have brought you out of that. Just as Jesus will say thousands of years later, come to me and I'm going to take this off. I'm going to give you rest for your souls. This was set up way before that. And here's my question. What if it's still true? What if, what if our worth is that we are? Are his, he's our God, and he's the one that's rescued us. Based on that, he goes on and says, listen, remember, remember to keep the Sabbath holy, to consecrate, sanctify the Sabbath. Work and get everything done during six days each week. I don't think he's saying, knock yourself out, just kill yourself for six days and then take a break. I don't think that's the implication here. I think he's saying, listen, you got six other days, do all the stuff you need to get done during that time. But the seventh day is a day of rest, a Sabbath to honor the Lord your God. The purpose of it is to honor God. And the best way to honor God is to believe in God and to follow what God has laid out, right? And again, he's not saying, thou shalt keep the Sabbath. He says, remember. On that day, no one, how many people? No one may do any work. Not you, not your son or daughter, not your male or female slave. So give them a break today, right? Not your animals. I love this, right? He starts going down the list and he gets broader and broader in the coverage, right? Because it's not just for us. It's for like everybody. Or the, res the, for the foreigners, the resident aliens, the, the migrants, right? Not just the immigrants, the migrants that have come to, to work some time here that are living in your cities, in your gates. This was a group of people, they were used to being slaves. In fact, not only have they been slaves, but you know, four generations, they had been slaves, 400 years. They were used to being slaves. They weren't used to being free. And this idea of Sabbath was scary to them. Because for 400 years, their identity had been what they could produce. That's their value of. If they didn't produce, they had no value. They would let them starve. For 400 years, they didn't have the idea what it meant to be free, to be able to make choices. It had been about what they could produce. And I love what God is saying in these two parts, the preamble and then the command to remember. And that's simply God says, that's not how it works now. Amen. It isn't about how you produce or how much you produce. That's not who you are anymore. You're not slaves anymore. So knock off being a slave. Back to Brene Brown. She wrote, it takes courage to say yes to rest and play in a culture where exhaustion is seen as a status symbol. Courage. And what if, what if Sabbathing is an act of courage, an act of resistance? What if it's a, a pushback to the pace of life that is all around us, that is always trying to move us along, move us along, right? Right? What if it's something sustainable in our unsustainable pace? What if it's the one rock solid thing that we ought to, that ought to be able to help kind of break that up? A sustainable thing that could help us in our unsustainable pace. But here's the reality, especially in, in the context of, of our church. We you know we meet on, on Saturday on Sabbath, right? Um, we kind of think God has these commandments. It's important that he left them for us for a reason. We ought to honor him. That's, he said this is the day to honor him, right? That's why we're here in this space. But I know sometimes some of you have come from um, other Adventist churches in different places, or maybe you grew up in an Adventist church. And um, the reality is that Sabbath for some of us can become like getting underwear as a gift. You know, it's something we need but don't necessarily appreciate in the moment. 
Because some of you, I mean, I've heard the stories. I didn't grow up as an Adventist. I didn't grow up as, as anything, right? I became a Christian and Adventist at the same time. That was the, 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 the connection with me. But some, and hearing the stories and, and being at this for quite a while now and watching how it sort of plays out, I know for a lot of people, when they hear Sabbath, they go, uh, right? So if it's you, go ahead and just say, uh, right now. Get it out. Yeah, see, I knew, I knew that you were out there, right? It's just like, uh, right? Because it's like, you know, you grew up in, in a space that said, listen, Sabbath is great. You just can't do anything. Not just not work. You can't, like, do anything, right? You can't watch anything on TV. You know, you can't listen to anything that you're not supposed to. You, know, you had all these lists of not supposed to stuff, right? And the problem is there were so many not supposed to stuff. It was like, wouldn't it have just been easier to make a can-do list? Because it would have been, like, really short as opposed to the can't-do list. And you think about, you know, is a day I can't play with friends, I can't you know, have fun, I can't do any of that kind of stuff. And the problem with that approach is it's not accurate to what God described. If you look at, read your Bible, you ought to read your Bible, read all the, all the different people that talk about the Sabbath. There are three things that the, three things, get three up here, three things that the Bible, yeah, one, eh? three things that the Bible says uh, you're not supposed to do on Sabbath. Not supposed to work, not supposed to buy or sell. That's the, that's the totality of the teaching. Everything else is people trying to figure out a way of, okay, what does it mean to honor the Sabbath and filling in the blanks. There is no other description than that. So all the stuff gets built up in order to protect the stuff, in order to honor God. What if honoring God is simply by making this a sustainable part of our pace in life? Uh, a day where we disengage from those things that that we earn, right, that, that, that we're producing, and a chance to do some different stuff, to take a break from all that, to, to both heal us in lots of different ways. Because here's what I know. You know, a lot of my, my work is, you know, um, I don't want to say it's mental because you'll kind of laugh at me because that's not true. But, um, you know, it's a lot of thinking. It's a lot of planning, planning for today, you know, talking with people. It's, I don't do a lot of manual labor, right? And for me, one of the best ways that I can sort of disengage from what I normally do is for somebody to give me a mindless task. Come help me build this, right? Move this over there. That's what your job. Move it. Just not to have to think, but just to be able to do, right? It is one of the greatest gifts that, that I, because what it does is it helps me use a different part of my body and actually helps revive me in some ways. Because what if, what if we rethought of Sabbathing as more get to than have to? Because for a lot of years, our particular group have made it about have to. You have to do this, you have to do that, you can't do that, you can't do this. What instead of have to, it became about get to? Because just changing those words changes how we think about it, how we feel about something, right? I get a, I get a not have to work. I get a step back from all that stuff. I get, a, I get a break from all the demands of normal life and I get a step into a different space. I get to do those things. Because the truth is, left to ourselves, we aren't always very good to ourselves. I mean, think of the things that we do to, to sort of fix our burnout. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to look at anybody, right? But just think about it, you know? Some of us, you know, food is a great comfort. Comfort foods, in fact, we call them, right? We call them comfort foods because... They make us feel better, right? They make us feel better to a certain degree, but when we kind of go past a good point, you no longer are we comforted by them, then we're like, uh, that was not a, not a really good thing to do, right? Uh, been around New Hope, you know that I love Ben and Jerry's, right? And they got some great chocolate. In fact, I, I used to love New York Super Fudge Chunk was my favorite. Now it's replaced by triple chocolate. Because if I'm going to eat it, it's better be chocolate. And, and, you know, it's so tempting, you know, after a rough day or a rough week is to kind of say, okay, I'm going to get out one of the pints and just kind of start eating out of the pint. And, you know, you get past the halfway point and it's like, there's not enough to save for later. And <laughs> don't want to be wasteful, you know, so you just kind of keep going and you get done with the pint and then you're like, uh, right, you know, it, it, it was so good going down, but now it's like, uh, right. Or maybe, you know, you've had that, you know, that, those moments when uh, uh, 
you, you know, you, you've turned to something else, right? And, and maybe, you know, you, it's like, I just need a break. I'm just going to mindlessly binge, binge some program, right? And you binge, and it's like, this is great. And then it's like, oh, man, it's three in the morning, you know? But there's like one more episode. What do I do, right? You know? And it's like, just go in and just finish this baby, right? And the next day, you're like, uh, right? I mean, because left to ourselves, we aren't always good to ourselves, right? In fact, some of the things we do to combat our burnout aren't the best for us. And we know that, that doesn't prevent us from doing it, but we know that, right? And the truth of the matter is, our time, our time is limited. We have 24 hours a day, and you have, if I could do math, I'd tell you how much in a week, but you have 24 hours a day, right? All of us get the same. What if, what if the key is to limit what we do with our time? Not, how, you know, not, not to use our time, but what, just what we do with our time. Because here's something... And this one, if you'd like to take a picture of this stuff, this is the time to take a picture. This may be the best thing I say today. So here it comes. Time off won't heal us if the problem is how we spend our time. Because we've all gone on those vacations, right? And, and we, you know, we kind of just went all for it and we got, it was like, oh, right? It didn't really do anything for us. Or we, you know, we talked about it last week, 41% of workers in America you know, I feel more burnout after vacation than when they were going on vacation. It was because they get back and all the stuff is piled up, right? Time off won't heal us if the problem is how we spend time. And the great reminder from God is that our existence didn't begin with what we could accomplish. You know, if you go back to the very first part of your Bible, this section called Genesis, Beginnings, You'll discover right at the, at the first couple of chapters, it describes how God creates all this stuff, right? And you may not kind of buy the whole creation thing, but we all buy, all buy whether you're an evolutionist, evolutionist or a creationist, we all buy that there was a something, something that kind of was a big bang, something that started everything, right? You would say, you know, just all this stuff miraculously all came together perfectly and this lightning bolt hit and, you know, everything just hit and somehow life began like Frankenstein. That's good. I'm glad you, you like that. You know, we as Christians and a lot of other religions would say, no, God started this all. God made this thing at the start. But in the Jewish Christian understanding, it didn't, we didn't begin with what we could accomplish. And the great thing is, it won't end with what we achieve either. Because if we go back to Genesis chapter two, where it's sort of the, God's created all this stuff, he gets to the end, He's just made people, they're less than 24 hours uh, old, right? A man and a woman who he puts there, that's, the, that's the, the, the teaching there. He says, by the seventh day, God finished, completed the work he'd been doing. He was done. Everything was perfect in his place. So we're told that he, God, rested. He ceased from all he had done. Everything's done, right? It's one of those moments, big check, to-do list, check, 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 got the best one, big, you know, it's all finished. To which we're told that then God blessed the seventh day and made it a holy day. He set it apart right at the very beginning that God sets this thing apart because on that day, he, talking about God, rested, ceased from all the work he had done in creating the world. That God blessed this, he set it apart as a memorial, a reminder that God was the, the one that created us in the first place and that we weren't starting with what we could accomplish, we were starting with what he had accomplished. Because what if it's not what we do, but that we are? Not about our performance. Not about proving our worth, which is kind of the reason, you know, we, we over so much, right? And what if... What if it never has been? Maybe even better, what if, what if it still isn't? If that's true, could we? Could we give ourselves a break then? Could we have the courage, have the, the resistance to step back and cease for just this 24-hour period? to not only honor God, but to honor ourselves. Maybe, maybe we need to rethink how we think about time. The time that we have and how we, 
I hope we use it. Maybe we need to think about, rethink about how we think about rest. I remember hearing somebody years ago say that the most spiritual thing you can do sometimes is to take a nap. And I think, he, I, think, I think that person was right. Sometimes some of us, you know, we just need some rest. We need a rest just to give our body a chance to slow down and, you know, you know get readjusted and renewed to help us get in a better spot. Maybe we need to rethink how we think about ceasing. More than just resting, but ceasing, stopping, right? Maybe, maybe we need to rethink how we think about Sabbath. Because maybe, maybe we need to take Jesus up on his offer of rest. And maybe that's the, the step that we, that maybe you or I need to take today that we have been reluctant to take or have been slow to take or have taken before but aren't really taking now to simply step towards Jesus, to come to him and allow him to, to lead us in a place where we do find rest, rest for our souls. Something to think about today.